connections or find uh, a farmer or a rancher to collaborate with. And I think one of the main focuses with this is we're not trying to make farmers into ranchers or ranchers into farmers. We're just hoping that everyone can collaborate and work together to start integrating livestock into a different system. Um, our feedlot on field system, though, it was it's just a really cool deal. So out, like Perry talked about with our plots out there, we had uh, year three and five in our rotation was winter wheat. And after harvesting winter wheat and about the same time as we're weaning lambs at Red Bluff, we would take the weaned lambs from Red Bluff and put them on our wheat stubble fields and actually finish them on the fields. And we weren't actually expecting them to graze the wheat stubble. We were bringing in supplementary or, uh, uh, pellets. We had two different diets. We either had a barley-based pellet or an alfalfa-based pellet, and we wanted to mimic you know, a typical confinement feedlot ration is probably gonna have a grain like barley in it, and then our alfalfa-based pellet is mimicking that forage-based diet, and forage finishing is becoming more and more popular. So we took our wheat stubble fields, we split them in half and put six lambs on one side, six lambs on the other side. One group of lambs was consuming the barley-based pellet, the other group was consuming the alfalfa-based pellet. And we fed them out there for 60 days total. I made these little feeders and I think I put a picture, yep, there's a picture on the feedlot on fields handout of these. They're actually little swine feeders that I just put a stall mat on top of to keep the elements out and it's on skids so we could actually pull these feeders around. We have a little John Deere gator, uh, six wheel, little ATV kind of thing and we could actually pull that feeder around the pot. So every day I would go out with my bag of pellets, you know, specific to the treatment, either alfalfa or barley, put it in their respective feeders, and then we would actually, every few days, pull that feeder around the wheat stubble plot to help spread out their manure since they like to congregate around their feeders. But our main purpose with this was to look at the effect on soil health. So we have all the sheep out there being finished, eating their supplement out there on the fields, and they're, instead of having that manure and urine as a detriment in the feedlot where you have a lot of, it's really a nuisance and it causes, um, it can cause respiratory problems with the amount of ammonia. You have all the manure that you have to get rid of. We're actually having the animals directly apply it to the field as a fertilizer. So we're just eliminating that need to haul it off or house those animals in confinement. So while we had the lambs out on the fields, we also had a similar group of lambs in confinement pens up here in the barn. And we'll do a little walk through after I talk here. Um, but we have grow safe feeders in the barns that actually can measure individual animal intake. So every lamb got an ear tag that has an EID tag, electronic identification device. When they stick their head in the feeder, the feeder has a scale in it with the feed on top. It actually measures the amount of feed that they're consuming every second. So for every single animal in there, you know exactly how much feed they were eating. They had the same treatments up in confinement as they did out in the fields. We had alfalfa or barley based pellets. We also threw in a salt study at the same time. So they were consuming either a block or loose salt to compare intake for that as well. Out in the field, we did not have individual animal intake. It was just based on a group, based on disappearance. So we took an average for that. Um, let me pull up my paper here, make sure I'm not missing anything. So our main focus, we have our three treatments out in the field. And we have the tilled organic, conventional with the herbicide treatment, and the grazed organic. And we wanted to compare our soil results between the three treatments. And we took samples of the soil before grazing and after, and we did this study for three years. This will be our, our final year. And we take our soil samples and then compare them to not only the barley versus the alfalfa, but uh, compare the conventional treated plots to the till to the graze. And we've seen some really positive aspects to, uh, in our results so far. Our results are all preliminary. We still have a whole other year of data to add in. Um, but it's looking really positive. And one of the big aspects of this project was looking at the soil microbes. And we hypothesized that having animals on the field would actually increase the diversity 
of the soil microbes in the soil compared to a conventional treated, you know, where we're using minimum tillage and herbicide compared to tillage, which could really disrupt the soil microbial communities. So on the back of this, I have a soil nutrient, sorry, I have a soil nutrient table. And I just, we, we looked at a lot of different soil nutrients. I just wanted to, for this, just to not overwhelm you guys, I wanted to focus on nitrogen, phosphorus, and organic matter. And so in the top row, you can see conventional, and then we have, I separated the graze treatment out by either consuming the alfalfa-based pellet or the barley-based pellet, and then our tillage plots. Uh, we saw no difference in nitrogen, phosphorus, we saw a, a definite significant difference that the graze plots had way more phosphorus than the conventional or the tilled. And organic matter, no difference. So we're kind of hoping to see more of the organic matter in our graze plots, but we're not seeing any detriment to having animals out on these fields. Uh, a lot of farmers are hesitant to putting livestock out on their fields because of compaction. And they're worried, well, if I have animals out there, they're just going to compact the soil and my crop yields are going to be decreased. So we did use a soil controlometer, which is a device that measures the amount of force it takes to push a probe down into the soil. And it's, um, it's not a bulk density measurement that Tristan will talk about, but it is uh, a good measurement to look at soil compaction. And as Perry said, we saw a little bit of soil compaction during extremely wet years when you have sheep out in the field and it's just the soil is extremely wet and they're out there, it can compact that top layer of soil. Um, on the front page of my hand out here. <laughs> Sorry guys, I don't have all the numbers memorized, so I, I need my tables to look at a little bit. Uh, but so for the soil controlometer, it measures soil penetration resistance. And we actually saw no difference between the conventional tilled or graze treatments, which is huge, uh, especially when, we're, when we're, we're using the soil controller in our tilled system. So if you're not seeing a difference between the graze system and our tilled, that's, that's really good news. And that is very encouraging that we're not seeing as much compaction in these treatments and we can integrate the livestock without damaging our soil properties. Now, I'm not a soil microbiologist, biologist, and so um, we are working with Carl Yeoman, who is actually a rumen microbiologist in our department, but he's been helping analyze our microbial data. So again, we took our soil samples before and after grazing and throughout all our tilled plots and conventional plots, and we did see a greater diversity of microbes in our graze system compared to our, our conventional system. Tilled had about the same diver amount of diversity, which is interesting, as our graze system. Uh, but the, the diversity, the increased diversity, and there's two different species that we're seeing, the Brady species and the Pseudomonas, and I'm probably saying those wrong, but they're, they're located around the rhizosphere, so around the plant roots, and they do, um, they have a lot of functions with plants like increasing, or nitrogen fixing, um, it really, the more intuitively, if you have more of those species in your soil, you're probably going to have increased plant growth. And so it's very positive that we're seeing, compared, compared to the conventional, we're seeing more of that in our graze systems. And that is really preliminary. We still have a lot of microbial data to go through. So hopefully we'll get, get that done soon. But Tristan will talk a little bit about that as well. For the species diversity, um, the way that the data is presented is in these scatter plots where they show, um, I guess, I guess a, a range of diversity. And let me look and see. Um, I, it's more of a probability plot of, of the probability of seeing that in a certain sample, and so I don't have I don't have comparison numbers yet for the amounts that you would see. But when I do get that, I'll make sure and we'll send this information out so you guys can tell. Um, it, it is significant though the prop, the higher probability of seeing those microbes in that in the graze or tilled system compared to conventional is significantly higher in the conventional system. I don't have actual numbers for microbial amounts, though. 
And again, that's not, I'm, I'm a sheep nutrition person, a, a soil microbiology. I, I understand, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure where I can analyze the data for that yet. Um, they've been using, they actually do DNA extraction techniques for the soil, and then they use a robot. Uh, in that process too. So the one day I tried to help them with that, I messed up and it didn't start. <laughs> I contaminated the soil and I just I need to stay on the practical level out here with the sheep. Uh, on the animal performance side of things, though, we're also really positive. And so we're having, you know, the sheep might be benefiting the farmer out there, but we want to make sure that they're still growing as well as they would in confinement. And what we did see is that sheep that were out in the field compared to finished in a confinement pen actually finished better than the sheep in confinement. So they're consuming the exact same feed, you know, just out of the road safe feeder versus those little feeders I created, but they actually had higher average daily gain, bigger ribeyes, um, and I think they had higher ending body weights as well. And the second year of our study, we had sub-zero temperatures for the last two weeks of our study. And I was pretty worried that sheep out on our wheat stubble fields were going to really drop off weight, which is completely stop eating. I was hauling water out there. I had a hose running from the hot water faucet in the lab to a tank on the truck. By the time I got the water out to the sheep, the hose was frozen. So it's really difficult to keep getting them water and feed, and actually those sheep still finish better than the sheep in confinement. And you can't compare this or look at this scientifically, but looking at the sheep in confinement versus out in the fields, the ones out in the fields were just, they had a better quality of life and were so much happier. Just watching them and observing them when I was out there, they were running around and playing constantly. We had mineral feeders out there that they were knocking over every day and playing with compared to the sheep in confinement that kind of just sat around and acted bored most of the time. And I kind of thought, well, if they're bored, they might eat more, but we actually didn't see that. They just kind of sat around and were lazy compared to the ones out there that ran around and played. And I don't know if that had something to do with the bigger ribeyes that we saw. They were exercising more and actually growing more muscle compared to sheep in confinement. Um, looking at the two diets, the alfalfa versus barley-based diet, Alfalfa has a lower digestibility, of course, than a grain like barley, and so sheep that were consuming the alfalfa out in the fields actually apply about 60% more manure to the fields. Um, alfalfa was more expensive to feed them because they consumed more because it wasn't as digestible, but if you're looking at uh, the aspect of applying that as a fertilizer to the soil, uh, feeding a, a forage might be beneficial in that point too. Um, oh, under the soil nutrient table in the back, I also sent in a couple samples of just manure samples from the sheep. And so I took one from the alfalfa treatments and the barley treatments and sent those in. And you can see the pounds of nutrient per ton is in that first table. And then uh, they did the estimated first year availability. And so of course not all of that nutrient in the manure is going to actually actually be plant available or to the soil. And so we looked at how much of that. So if they're, you know, if, uh, let's see for the gray alfalfa for nitrogen, about 13% nitrogen is, or there's about 13% nitrogen in that manure sample. Um, but only 4.43 is actually available that first year. And in subsequent years, it can become more available, but a lot of it is kind of tied up in that manure and it's not available to the plant. So about 35% of the nitrogen that's coming out in the manure is actually available that first year. So that was kind of interesting information too. And as Dave, Dave points out too, that it might not be plant available, but it still might be microbe available. So it's still helping increase that soil health and the biodiversity in the soil. Um, I have a picture on the back too of how we look at tenderness in lambs. So for each year we harvested, the first two years of the study, we harvested 30 lambs from all the different treatments so we could look at their carcass traits. 
and we did this at Big Timber, and so we were present for all of it. We also did a parasite study at the same time, but we added so many different things to the study. You guys would be here all day. I talked about all the aspects. I'm trying to focus a little bit more on the soil health, but the animal performance is really interesting to me. Um, for tenderness, uh, sheep consuming alfalfa were less tender than those consuming barley. And that's pretty typical. Usually animals that are consuming a grain-based diet will be more tender than forage-based. But, so scientifically, there is a, st a, t a statistical difference, uh, but as a consumer, you wouldn't actually taste that difference in tenderness. So the values for tenderness were actually lower. Usually if you're on a three, let's say, is, is a tender animal, all of our animals from both treatments were below that number. So as a consumer, you actually wouldn't be able to taste a difference in tenderness. And we actually used the Warner Brassler Shear Force, and that's what the picture is on there. Um, we cooked, we took lamb chops from every single carcass, and we cooked all of these lamb chops. We put a temperature probe in them and cook them in the oven at a certain temperature, you flip them over, and so they cook exactly the same for all the treatments. And then we take core samples from every lamb chop, and you put it in this little machine that has a blade that comes down and cuts that core in half, and it measures how much force it took to actually cut that core. So it's kind of interesting information about how tenderness is measured you know, compared to a consumer panel that might be a panel of consumers that would do a taste test. But that's the scientific way of doing tenderness. Uh, we also saw no difference in quality grade. So whether they were in confinement or out in the field or consuming alfalfa versus barley, no difference in quality grade. So it really seems like as a sheep producer, if you can keep your animals out on the field and finish them. It was, it was fairly labor intensive when it was negative 20 and I was hauling 50 pound bags of feed out there, but um, also in a research setting where I have 12 different fields with different diets. Might have been a little more labor consuming than just a typical operation where you might go drive up with the truck instead of hauling bags by hand. So, you guys have any questions about, about this? I went over it pretty fast, so I wouldn't mind spending a little bit more time if there's any questions. Yep. Devin, what were the different rates in the game between the all bar, uh, all alfalfa and the barley? The rates of gain were really similar. They, they were pretty similar. They were all a little less than half a pound a day. So about, I think it was 0.45. Any other uh, As Pat mentioned, Dr. Hatfield, he did say that feeding alfalfa is a much safer forage or a much uh, safer feed source just because you don't have all the problems with acidosis that you would have with a grain-based diet. So you have uh, less of the up and downs when you're feeding. Uh, we stepped animals up really slowly to both diets, but you still have to be really careful when you're feeding a grain-based diet that you step them up slowly so they don't have any problems with acidosis. So if you can uh, finish on a forage, it's a little bit safer and it keeps the room and microbes a little happier than uh, a complete grain-based diet.